Hello and welcome to episode 19 of Radicals in Conversation, the monthly podcast from Pluto Press, one of the world's leading independent radical publishers. We're here in the studio on the 8th of May. In 10 days' time, millions of people around the world will tune in to the 64th annual Eurovision Song Contest. Ordinarily, this probably wouldn't merit a mention on our show. Last year, however, Israel's Neta Barzillai won the competition with the song Toy, doing so with a comfortable 93-point margin over runner-up Cyprus. As a result, next week, Eurovision broadcasts live from Tel Aviv, and in doing so, wades deep into political controversy. Netta's victory in 2018 was seen by the Israeli government as something of a diplomatic triumph, reinforcing the narrative of Israel's LGBT and queer-friendly credentials. But the Palestinian reality of continued occupation and apartheid has not been elided, and accusations of pinkwashing and artwashing, along with calls to boycott Eurovision altogether, have gained considerable traction in the last few months. I'm Chris Brown, and joining me today to discuss this unlikely flashpoint in the history of the Palestinian struggle and the BDS campaign are Hilary Ackert, a London-based writer, researcher and activist who is currently writing a book about the Israel lobby in the UK, Salma Kami Ayoub, a criminal barrister and consultant for Palestinian human rights organisation al Haq, and Alia Malak, a British Palestinian from the Palestinian Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel, or PACB. So Eurovision's being held in the same week as Palestinians around the world are commemorating the Nakba. Um, Perhaps one of you can explain more fully what that is in a moment to any of our listeners who might be unaware. But the proximity of these two things, although entirely coincidental, really kind of to my mind highlights what's at issue here. So Eurovision, which is supposed to be this kind of kitsch, fun, uh, inclusive celebration, is being used to mask the reality of Palestinian exclusion. Um, of displacement, occupation and apartheid. And the Eurovision venue, the Expo Tel Aviv Centre, was literally built, I think, on the remains of a former village um, whose residents were displaced in 1948. So this is deeply and unavoidably political. But before we talk more about Eurovision or the BDS movement today, perhaps we can just take a few moments to put all of this in its historical context. So for anyone who's listening who's perhaps less familiar with Israel-Palestine as an issue. Salma, would you like to maybe jump in there? Yeah, so um, I think it's it's important uh, to understand what the so-called Israel-Palestine conflict is really about. Um, it's basically a struggle over um, land. So there was a country, Palestine, which was under British mandate rule at the end of the First World War. Um, and during that period, um, Britain basically um, facilitated uh, European Jewish immigration to Palestine and the establishment eventually of a so-called Jewish state, which became Israel. Now, the problem with this was that there was an indigenous population in Palestine, the Palestinian Arabs, uh, and they lived all over the country, um, and they were naturally opposed to this colonization and establishment of a settler state in their country. And they resisted as best they could, but uh, in 1948... Zionist militia, so they're the militia belonging to the movement of European Jews that wanted to establish a state, expelled uh, close to a million indigenous Palestinians from the territory that became the state of Israel and destroyed hundreds of Palestinian villages and many Israeli towns and cities like Tel Aviv, where the Eurovision will be held, are actually built on the remains of these uh, destroyed villages. Those close to a million Palestinians were never allowed to return to their homes and now constitute one of the largest and most enduring refugee populations uh, and problems in the world. Um, In 1967, Israel fought a war with surrounding Arab countries and went on to occupy militarily the remainder of the territory of Palestine, Mandate Palestine, that they hadn't captured, that hadn't been captured in 1948. So that's what people know as the West Bank and Gaza. That's been under military occupation for the last 50 years with countless human rights abuses being perpetrated on a daily basis. And so where we are now in 2019 is essentially Palestinians are fighting for their survival on their land. Um, They're resisting being ethnically cleansed by Israeli forces. Uh, And I think Israel is using the Eurovision as an opportunity to kind of portray itself as this law-abiding, peaceful, pluralistic state when it's in fact a state that's in the process of an active ethnic cleansing campaign against an indigenous population. There's a sort of certain irony in Eurovision's message of togetherness and unity, given that many Palestinians, even those who are living only like a few miles away from the venue, will be unable to attend because of the existence of this physical infrastructure designed to uphold their separation. So what's the reality of day-to-day life 
now for Palestinians living in Gaza and the West Bank? I think what you said before when you were talking about how Eurovision's really like kitsch and fun and it's all about like just having a great time and that's also kind of I think how Israel really markets Tel Aviv I think that that's just completely different to the Palestinian experience and actually you know for Palestinians in the West Bank they live under military occupation Um, there's no freedom of movement there's almost you know continuous attempts to dispossess them of their land with settlement building and the, the sort of Tel Aviv bubble that people who are going to Eurovision are going to go to is not accessible to Palestinians from the West Bank. It's certainly not accessible to Palestinians who live in Gaza, who've been under siege and constant brutalisation from the Israeli army for over a decade now. You know, Gaza's considered by the UN to be unlivable, that it will be unlivable in 2020. But I think, you know, many Palestinians in Gaza would argue that it's pretty unlivable now. Speaking from a slightly more personal perspective as well. My family are from Gaza and I have cousins who've, you know, never left the Gaza Strip, which is a tiny piece of land, who, you know, don't have any kind of opportunity to really go and experience this, like, fun liberal haven, which is apparently being created about 25 minutes, half an hour drive away. And I think that it's actually that contrast which a lot of people find to be quite repulsive about the fact that the Eurovision is being held in Tel Aviv, that all of these things which are so different are happening so close together and that people are being excluded on the basis of their ethnicity. And I think that's really at the crux of the Palestinian experience in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip and actually in the diaspora, wherever wherever we are. I think that sums up the Palestinian experience is that there are certain things which are not accessible to us, which we are shut out from because of our ethnicity. Yeah, and just to add, um, I totally agree with what Alia was saying. For a while, um, I was lucky enough to live in the West Bank for about three years. And because I had a British passport, even though I'm of Palestinian heritage, I was allowed to move freely around the country like a tourist. And I was able to see this really fractured, kind of schizophrenic reality on the ground in Israel-Palestine. So what what you have is the West Bank completely um, is militarily occupied and, and completely broken up into pieces with the establishment of Israeli settlements, checkpoints, brutal incursions by Israeli soldiers almost on a daily basis. People in the West Bank can't cross checkpoints to enter into Jerusalem or then enter into territory that's now considered in modern state of Israel. So, for example, you could be 45 minutes away from Tel Aviv by car in the West Bank, but if you're a Palestinian, you can't cross over to get there. But I could drive from a place that's militarily occupied where you see soldiers around you all the time to Tel Aviv, have this kind of bubble experience where it feels really hedonistic and people are having fun and going to clubs and partying on the beach. And then 45 minutes down the road south, there's this enormous open air prison which is the Gaza Strip where people are besieged and are literally slowly being starved to death Mm -hmm. by Israeli policies and you could be on the beach in Tel Aviv and hear warplanes going overhead sort of tangentially aware of the fact that they were probably going to bomb civilians just down the road in Gaza in this place where no one who's Palestinian inside Gaza can leave or or re-enter. So it's just you know, I agree with you. There's something abhorrent and grotesque about the idea of celebrating Israel's so-called pluralism and diversity and funness in that kind of situation. Yeah, and I think also more than that, it's not just that all of this is happening, this Tel Aviv bubble exists and Palestinians are not there. I think it's that it's the fact that it exists because Palestinians are not there and because Palestinians are not allowed to return to their homes. I think that it was really sort of illustrative of the point, the fact that, as you said in the introduction, the venue for Eurovision is held in a place which is literally built on the ruins of a, a Palestinian village. So all of this hedonism and, I guess, so-called liberalism is able to exist because Palestinians aren't allowed to access that space. And I think that's also something that is clearly you know, morally reprehensible. So as I understand it, 2019 is not going to be the first time that Israel has 
not just competed in the competition, but it's not, it's not even the first time it's hosted it. Um, I think it was held in Jerusalem in 1979, and I think they hosted again in 1999. Now this year it's being held in Tel Aviv instead. I think that decision was made by the European Broadcasting Union, uh, which sponsors the contest. Now what's changed since 1999, let's say, the last time Israel hosted the competition, that would make Jerusalem too controversial a choice in the eyes of the, the EBU to be the host city this year? Because obviously there's been a lot going on with specific regard to Jerusalem and its status um, within the state of Israel. So in 2005, Palestinian civil society issued um, a call for boycott, divestment and sanctions, BDS, um, to international organisations, civil society and people of conscience around the world to apply pressure um, on Israel until it complies with international law. And the reason that Palestinians did that was because traditional, you know, so-called peace talks and negotiations had failed to bring about peace, justice, equality, freedom. And so that that, that kind of movement, that call was modelled on the, the case of apartheid in South Africa, where an international civil society boycott made a, an important contribution to ending apartheid there. And um, over the last, what year are we in now? Over the last nearly 15 years, it's really grown substantially as a movement and it can't be ignored. And we've seen that really in the way that the question of whether whether Eurovision should be boycotted has dominated the media coverage of Eurovision in Israel. And it's really been quite successful. So Globes, which is the Israeli kind of version of the Financial Times, reported that... Um, Tourism has not actually seen a significant boost in Israel. So, and uh, I think it was Jerusalem Post said ticket sales are not doing very well. So people are actually, I think, you know, Israel is very obviously trying to use um, Eurovision, as, as has been said, as a way to mask its kind of colonial oppression of Palestinians. But it's a case to be made that it's backfiring quite quite dramatically in Palestinians and their allies have succeeded in using the event and the exposure to reveal the, you know, the way Palestinians are treated and um, people are staying away from Eurovision and pe- more people are kind of learning about the boycott and supporting the boycott. Mm. I mean, Hilary, you've kind of touched on it there, but um, Alia, perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about the BDS movement more broadly, um, the origins of that and the other areas in which it's kind of taken shape. Like Hilary said, the BDS movement kind of came about because peace talks and also Attempts to seek justice in the international courts were proving to be fruitless. And I think for a lot of people who were active at the time, when the uh, ICJ ruled in 2004, I think, Sam, feel feel free to correct me if that's not right, (laughs) um, that the separation wall or the apartheid wall that runs through the West Bank was illegal and should be demolished. And then absolutely nothing happened, it became quite clear that there needed to be another way to sort of redress the power balance because that's not something that Palestinians were finding that they could really do in this sort of, I I suppose, more formal settings of negotiations or of um, international courts. So the BDS call was put out in 2005 and it was signed and endorsed by the majority of uh, Palestinian civil society organisations, which represented also Palestinians from all walks of life and all kinds of backgrounds. So it was endorsed by Palestinian citizens of Israel, Palestinian refugee organisations, as well as Palestinian organisations in the West Bank and Gaza Strip and the diaspora. And I think that's actually what gives BDS its legitimacy. Like many people, and probably more than most people, Palestinians really don't agree on very much. (laughs) You know, we disagree about a lot of things all the time. But actually, there is consensus in Palestinian society that BDS is the way that we want to resist our oppression. And it's also a really easy way for people to be involved in, in supporting that struggle and in showing solidarity. And I think as well, it's really important to emphasize the fact that The BDS movement is really based on principles of freedom, justice and equality. And actually, the foundation of that is that Palestinians deserve to have the same rights as as everybody else. Um, Since 2005, it has become a global movement. Um, There are BDS groups or groups engaged with BDS in almost every country in the world. And it's something that has been 
endorsed and taken up by lots of different groups. So there's activist groups, but there's also unions, academic associations, church groups as well. The beauty of it is that it's something that everyone can get involved with and it's something that all groups can use to hold their institutions to account in a way that really does make tangible change on the ground in Palestine. One thing that we've seen recently is probably, I would argue, because of the success of BDS, certainly its prominence is the quite significant backlash against it legislatively um, here in the UK, uh, elsewhere in America as well. Yeah, I mean, in the US, for example, I think more than 20 states have passed legislation um, which seeks to deny state funding for organisations which support BDS. We've seen individuals even lose their jobs when they've been asked to sign pledges, agreements with their employers saying that they will not support BDS. And there have been some really important legal cases happening recently pushing back against that on grounds of um, freedom of speech, which is supposedly a kind of very highly valued thing in the United States. You know, here in the UK, um, the picture is more complex. The most prominent means by which the government has sort of clamped down on BDS is probably through local councils. So both um, changing guidance around um, procurement and also um, trying to block the divestment initiatives that are seeking to divest from these huge pension funds which local authorities are sitting on. But also, you know, a lot of pressure on universities during Israeli Apartheid Week, which happens uh, February here in the UK, I think, and seeking to clamp down on student activism uh, that way. But I think what's interesting is that despite that quite heavy top-down coercion from you know, the state. BDS, it operates in a really different way. It's like a grassroots bottom-up movement, which requires moral persuasion alone, essentially. And there's a limited amount that that kind of coercion can do when you have a grassroots movement who, you know, you can't force people to buy Israeli goods um, individually, but you also can't. There are ways to get around uh, these initiatives to sort of repress it, I think. Yeah, I mean, I might just add that I think we're in quite sort of an interesting historical moment because what we see is this kind of real disconnect I think between popular opinion which I actually think is really um, mainly with the Palestinians now in in Europe and even in the United States in large pockets of the US and the success of initiatives like BDS in highlighting Israeli repression and in kind of spreading the message in public opinion that Israel should be treated as a pariah. And as a result, you have this enormous, like, unprecedented backlash. I mean, the idea that uh, legislators in the United States are actually making laws that would prevent people from supporting BDS, that would criminalise support for BDS, the fact that France has pursued criminal prosecutions of BDS activists, the fact that the UK is promulgating these regulations to try to interfere with local council decisions is just so... It, it's an, it's unprecedented. I don't think there has been that kind of legislative action in response to other any other grassroots movement, or at least not to the same extent. And Eurovision, I think, is another example of this. I don't think that the decision to host Eurovision Tel Aviv is that popular. I think Israel's expecting a lot of trouble. It's invested apparently more than $30 million or something, isn't it, into into securing the venue and so on. And this is enormous, enormous investment to be making for a singing competition. And I just think it demonstrates the fact that we're at, there is a clash at the moment between what governments um, and I suppose those in positions of power want to do and what is generally public opinion. And the other piece of this, I think, in this country is the IHRA definition, so the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism, which was it's a definition that was sort of floating around um, and was formally endorsed by the UK government at the end of 2016 and is used purportedly to decide when an anti-Semitic incident has occurred um, to enable public bodies to clamp down on anti-Semitism when they see it. But in reality, it's being used as a tool to also um, clamp down on BDS because it contains provisions that say that calling the state of Israel a racist endeavour is a form of anti-Semitism and that singling Israel out for criticism that you wouldn't level against other countries could also be anti-Semitic. And I think both of those provisions are clearly directed at stifling BDS activism because, of course, BDS singles Israel out in the sense that it's calling for a boycott of Israel. And part of the BDS movement's um, narrative is that Israel is practising apartheid and that's something that's been backed up by 
by many others, including legal experts. But So we're seeing, I think, a, a really ferocious backlash against what has been quite a successful form of popular mobilisation and a huge disconnect, like I said, between popular opinion and kind of government positions. And just to add to that, if I may, um, uh, as, as Summer alluded to, um, this backlash is coming in its origin from the Israeli government itself, right? So, and the Zionist movement. So in 2010, I think it was the Royut Institute in Tel Aviv issued this quite seminal report called Building a Firewall Against Delegitimization, which is the Zionist movement's term for criticizing Israel, criticizing Zionist ideology. And it argued that, you know, the BDS movement should be quote unquote sabotaged. And the Israeli government has really absorbed that strategy. And you've seen uh, a whole ministry, the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, whose head is Gilad Erdan, uh, founded and, and, and funded to the tune of millions of dollars to lead uh, this global backlash against BDS. But what they have to do, obviously, it doesn't look great for a nation state to be um, clamping down on um, civil society actors around the world. So they they work, you know, in cooperation with a lot of um, pro-Israel organizations who do exist in civil society. And um, just to also come back quickly, and I mean, there are some interesting parallels with the South African case as well. I mentioned the apartheid well, it's not an analogy, the apartheid reality and the boycott tactic as a, as a use to to oppose that. But also in South Africa, the government there ran a, a really massive propaganda operation uh, by the Department of, of Information, which is a lot of the same tactics, you know, using front groups sometimes. And the Al Jazeera documentary um, showed that Israel is doing that to quite a quite considerable extent. You know, Eurovision fits in very well to Israel has this official nation branding program called Brand Israel. So it's, it's yeah, I'll leave it there. We've talked about it already, but how does Eurovision fit in with uh, Brand Israel? Yeah, so Brand Israel is essentially a strategy to kind of use primarily culture to show Israel's prettier face. Um, and I think that Eurovision fits into that really nicely. It's been a huge sort of marketing opportunity for Israel to sort of say to people like, oh, come come here and see Eurovision and like, you know, have a terrible Israeli beer on Tel Aviv beach. like, And, and just kind of market itself as this holiday destination. And I think that's been a really big part of trying to make itself palatable to people. I think that that's quite a difficult thing to do when, you know, over the weekend, so just two weeks before uh, Eurovision will take place, Israel launched a massive bombing campaign in Gaza and murdered 25 Palestinians, including pregnant women and children. Um, but I think that the sort of rhetoric around Eurovision has really given Israel this opportunity to present itself as a place where people can come and have fun and sort of forget about the outside world um, and I think that's also why it has been very keen to, to do things like invest in security so that people come and they'll feel safe and Israel kind of also manages to shed this image of being this place of violence um, and I think that that's the way that Eurovision is slotting in. Yeah, I mean, the, the Israeli government um, formally certainly asked artists, which it helped to fund, to go overseas, to sign a contract saying that part, part of what they understood themselves to be doing was uh, acting as representatives of Israel. It's published in Haaretz, uh, um, an excerpt from what that used to happen. I mean, it's been very explicit that... So there's a Canadian-Israeli billionaire, I forget his name, but he's paying Madonna a reported, you know, million plus to appear. For two and songs, I think. For mm -hmm. two songs, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I do like Madonna, I've got to say, but um, Israel does collaborate with kind of some of these elite funders of the Zionist movement to bring like so-called mega events um, to Israel or to stage them over here. We had something called the Shalom Festival in Edinburgh, at the Edinburgh Festival happening for a few years running now, which happens with Stand With Us as well. And another a big aspect of this I wanted to mention was pinkwashing. So I think it was mentioned earlier at the start, um, Israel has this supposed image of being LGBT friendly. The extent to which that's true is questionable anyway. I mean, somebody was murdered at a Pride Parade a few years ago. There's homophobia and transphobia in every society. But also its use of pinkwashing is totally cynical 
to distract attention from um, the oppression of Palestinians. I mean, it also, um, Honey and Mikey from Al Cows talks about how it makes the homophobia and transphobia which exists in Palestinian society arguably worse by encouraging people who might not know about it or have those attitudes to associate LGBT rights with this oppressive apartheid regime, which is, you know, removing their freedom. Mm. But also I think about the Eurovision. What's interesting about Eurovision is the battleground that it occupies is all relates to what um, Richard Falk, who's an international lawyer, has coined the legitimacy war that's currently being fought between, you could say, Israel on the one hand and Palestinians and, and sort of Palestinian grassroots on the other. So if we look at BDS objectively, you know, it hasn't had a very big impact. I don't know if it's had any impact or a negligible impact in practical terms on Israel's economy, for example. So unlike South Africa, which at one point was facing sanctions, which are really going to have a serious effect on their economy, Israel is kind of immune at the moment, at least from from those sorts of measures because of the fact that governments around the world support it. So what we're really looking at is the, to use Israel's term, the delegitimizing impact of BDS, the way that it allows people to portray Israel in its true uh, colours as being this apartheid uh, regime, a colonial occupier. And Israel is so exercised about that issue that even though it may not be harming it economic terms, it will fight uh, for its reputation and it will promote initiatives like Brand Israel, Eurovision, to try to mask its true nature at, at, at really a great cost. So there's a, you know, the fact that there's an Israeli Ministry of Strategic Affairs has been set up solely to discredit um, the BDS movement and other similar initiatives And the fact that so much is being put into allowing Eurovision to happen, I just think it demonstrates the extent to which Israel cares about this question of its legitimacy in the international arena. And it wants to avoid at any cost initiatives that show its lack of legitimacy, basically. I mean, all countries care about their public image, but I think Israel takes it to the next level. Mm. Mm. I mean, we believe in Israel, which is a spin-off of... Bicom, the biggest Israel lobby group in UK, held something called a Zionism Month last year, or maybe it was the year before. And they even described the reason for doing that as um, to restore the the case for um, the Jewish state, which was an admission that, you know, people increasingly don't think that an ethno-nationalist ideology is a legitimate way to um, structure a nation state, I suppose. Exactly. I, I mean, I think that's that's really what's at stake here. It's, it's very fundamental questions about the nature of the Israeli state, the nature of the Israeli regime, whether or not it fits in to what is perceived to be a European kind of liberal democratic club of nations. And I think that, in fact, Eurovision exemplifies this more than anything because it's about literally be, being in that club of Europe. And so it's crucial for them to host it and to be seen to be a natural member of Eurovision and to rely on the very few things they can rely on, such as, for example, potentially slightly better rights for LGBT if you're an Israeli Jew and really only if you're in Tel Aviv added to that. I mean, being LGBT in Jerusalem isn't much fun, even if you're, Jew, if you're an Israeli Jew. So they're using whatever little, they're kind of pulling at straws. Is that a saying? Pulling at straws? I think I made that up. Clutching at straws. straws. (laughs) Any liberal sort of or civil freedoms they do provide, they emphasise for hosting Eurovision in order to try to justify their membership in the Club of European Nations. And that's not a membership they deserve. It's not where they really belong. And so BDS is trying to reveal this ethno-nationalistic nature of the Israeli regime that's antithetical to liberal democracy. I think as well it's about, in terms of how the BDS movement's kind of approached this, is that it's about not allowing Israel to use events like Eurovision as effective distractions from its violations of international law, from the war crimes it commits against Palestinians. But actually, for every time something like this does happen, for every time that Israel hosts an international event, for example, that actually becomes a a problem and becomes an opportunity to kind of shed a light on what is happening on the ground. And I think that's the thing that the BDS movement has been really effective at in terms of Eurovision, because as Hillary said before, airlines have reported that there's not not been a bump in sales. Um, Hotels are dropping their prices because not enough people are booking rooms. There's still tickets available for Eurovision itself. And I think that kind of shows that, in that sense, the campaign has been really successful. 
Yeah, I mean, before we kind of round things off, I guess it's interesting um, talking about the fact that it's like an ethnocratic state, that it's a racist endeavour. This is only something that is becoming more set in stone, I suppose, with the passing of the, the controversial nation state law last year in the Knesset, which was met with some criticism at the time from the EU, but again, not much in the way of concrete action pushing back on that. Um, what are the implications of that law vis-a-vis the ethnocratic nature of the state? Just a small question then. A, a very small question. <laughs> I'll, okay, I'll try. I'll try and just sort of give an overview. So, I think what the nation-state law does is this, it's a law which basically says that Israel it defines Israel as a nation-state for the Jewish people, and it says that only the Jewish people has a right to express uh, self-determination in the land of Israel, which is where the state of Israel is established, and it's widely uh, construed to be a constitutional law. So, in other words, it defines the nature of the state and the political community that the state represents. So why is that important? Um, It's important because it's saying the political community that the state represents are the Jewish people and the Jewish people only. And those are Jewish people who are living in Israel, but also potentially Jewish people living anywhere in the world. Now, Israel is established on land and controls territory, half of the inhabitants of which are not Jewish, they're Palestinian Arabs. So this law in effect, um, cements Israel's ethnocratic nature. It says that Israel is a state that only represents and serves one ethnic community that it presides over. The other ethnic community of Palestinian Arabs are excluded from representation by the state and are not considered to be members of the political community that the state is constituted on behalf of. What that does, as I said, is it makes it explicit um, that Israel excludes Palestinian Arabs and will, will of course, as a result, have to, by definition, in fact, by law, discriminate against them. It's not a, a law which necessarily changes the Israeli regime dramatically because this was already embedded in the structure of Israeli laws and state institutions before the uh, issuance of the law. What the law does is it makes it explicit and it kind of adds another layer to things. It makes it a clear declaratory position. It means that the Israeli Supreme Court, for example, is much more limited in what it can do if it's petitioned by Palestinians for rights because this law really puts things in their place. I don't want to emphasise the importance of it and say that Israel was a democratic state before the law. It it wasn't. It already had apartheid policies and practices, and this law essentially just makes that more explicit. Yeah, I think that's how a lot of um, Palestinians who are citizens of Israel saw it, as well as like it's not not a surprise to to them or actually to any Palestinian that Israel is an, is an apartheid state. But I think it was the fact that it was really formalized, and actually, I think. Politically, the fact that the government had the confidence to do that, to be so brazen about it, I think says a lot about what the current far-right Israeli government... Well, actually, it's not the current government anymore, it's the past past government, but um, what the far-right in Israel, who are still in power, feel that they can get away with. And I think, actually, the fact that the response was so muted internationally kind of proved that as well. And I think that's another reason why, you know, now more than more than ever, initiatives from the grassroots like BDS are really important because I think the adoption of the nation state law and the sort of almost like tacit approval that it had from the international community is such damning evidence that, you know, people in positions of power are not going to have the right politics on this. We, we have to drag them kicking and screaming to take the right positions and to take the positions that are going to serve the cause of justice in Palestine. So how can fans of Eurovision and non-fans as well, I suppose, of course, um, actually, (laughs) who don't support the occupation, offer meaningful solidarity then? I would say that if you're a viewer, don't tune in. Um, I think it would be great if Eurovision was this Eurovision was like the least watched Eurovision of all time Um, but there's also around the world there's been alternative parties that have been popping up so if you do want to go and still have a night out on Eurovision just go to an alternative Eurovision party Uh, I think that's a really really good way of showing solidarity and also it's quite fun Um, and I think in general when people are talking about Eurovision not to let it slide, like don't be afraid to kind of politicise it and to problematise it and say 
that actually the fact that it's in Israel means that this year Eurovision isn't going to be like it has been every other year and that this year is different. Mm. Yeah, and I think people can just spread the message to, let's say, friends or family that perhaps aren't so knowledgeable about the issue. Yeah. That, you know, Eurovision, by being held in Israel, is actually supporting apartheid and ethnic cleansing. It's not a neutral issue. You know, kick up as much of a fuss about it, I would say, as possible, so that it does problematise it, so that at the very least, people who aren't knowledgeable mm-hmm. about the situation um, become aware that there's something not right about Eurovision yeah. this year. And, you know, the BDS movement, what it essentially does is put up a picket line around Israel. And I think the very least that people can do to support the Palestinian struggle for justice is not to cross it and to respect the the call for a boycott. Yeah, thank you very much to Hillary, Alia and Salma all for taking time to come on the show. Um, so once again, if you love Eurovision but hate human rights abuses, You can host your own Eurovision party or go along to one of the countless alternative events that are taking place uh, across Europe uh, that have been set up in response. Uh, There's a fairly comprehensive list on, I think, boycotteurovision.uk, so you can check that out. Uh, You've been listening to Radicals in Conversation, and we will be back next month. Thanks for tuning in. 